all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, beyond gracious, beyond merciful, the one whom guides, and for who he guides, they cannot be misguided. And for who he misguides, they cannot be guided to the truth. I testify that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only, only, not even thing, nothing that can be worshipped. Because no word can encompass what he is. And I testify by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final prophet, the seal of the prophets, the most perfect man to have ever walked this earth. And the greatest example for all of us, a mercy sent to mankind. I ask of you all to make a dua for me that I may be able to communicate with you in the most coherent manner possible. Um, this is actually my first major lecture um, and I am actually quite nervous. <laughs> so if you could please make a dua for me, I would really appreciate that. And that Allah may accept my deeds today, that it may be weighed on the good scale <laughs> on the day of judgment and that it may be expiation for my sins. Amin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Asadullah Ali Al Andalusi. Um, prior to uh, getting into this uh, interesting lecture, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm standing up here today. Um, I um, have been studying this very subject here for the past seven years of my uh, academic career. Uh, I did my bachelor's in uh, Western philosophy. I did my master's in Islamic philosophy, and um, well, I decided to change uh, career paths after that, so now I'm doing my PhD in Sharia, <laughs> because uh, my mother inquired how I was going to get a job um, with philosophy degree, and I used to tell her that uh, I can think long, deep thoughts about unemployment, <laughs> but um, so I decided to change my, my, my degree to Sharia. And um, she told me, oh, that's so good. You know, now you can do law and other such things. And uh, my PhD thesis is on ISIS. So um, she wasn't quite happy about that because you know, now it seems as though I might be in danger in the future. Uh, but at least my life has gotten a little bit more exciting. Um, let's see. I am also uh, from the United States. Uh, however, my family is originally from Spain, hence my title, Al Andalusi. So in case any of you have any uh, confusion about that. So I think that's enough about me. I don't want to make this whole lecture about myself. So uh, let's actually get right into it. Uh, if you could please. Lovely. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay. Okay, so why are we here? Why are we discussing atheism today? Uh, many of you have uh, signed up for this course to learn about atheism, to understand atheism. Um, at least I hope so. Unless you're here just because you're bored. I mean, you know, that's another thing you can do. Um, but why are we here to discuss atheism? Well, atheism is actually a rising problem globally. Um, a recent report uh, in Gallup Poll International 2012, and this is the most recent that they currently have, actually. We haven't gotten anything more recent than that, um, showed that there was a rise of atheism globally at 3% and a steady decline of religiosity at 9%. Okay. Um, some of the countries mentioned show the following numbers of convinced atheism within their populations. If you could please click the, uh, keep going, Saudi Arabia, Palestine, Pakistan, and Malaysia. So I picked some Muslim countries here to, to uh, you know, pique your interest a little bit. Uh, so let's see, what about Saudi Arabia? 5% convinced atheists, please uh, wait for me to... Uh, who thinks, uh, what about Palestine? Who here can answer me? How many atheists, convinced atheists are in Palestine? I'm not talking about Israel, I'm talking about Gaza and the West Bank. 17% atheist? MashaAllah. <laughs> okay, wow. I <laughs> Anybody? Any else? Hmm? 10%. 10%, a little bit high. I'm going to say about 4%, okay? How about Pakistan? Mostly majority, probably what, 99%? Let me try that one. How many? 
Mm, you guys are really pessimistic. <laughs> it's like you're shooting really high. Can you go? 2%. Okay. How about Malaysia? 1%. Alhamdulillah, right? <laughs> Zero. Zero percent convinced atheist in Malaysia, apparently. We're going to get to that in a second. But before we do, before I discuss these numbers and what they actually mean, okay, for the given populations that I've just listed, I want to mention how many registered as irreligious. Can you please click? 19% for Saudi Arabia claim that they are not religious Muslims. Okay? 29% of Palestine, 29%, of, that's almost a third of the whole population, claims that they are not religious at all. Meaning they just believe in God. Okay, they don't practice. 8% in Pakistan, and 13% in Malaysia. 13. All right. Now, if we combine these numbers, obviously it's a little bit higher now. It's more significant. Okay. And there's actually a correlation between these numbers. You may think that being non-religious means that it has no connection to atheism, but actually that, that there's, that's quite the opposite is true. If we can go on, please. And one of the reasons I, I speculate about the 0% in Malaysia is because of forums like this. Uh, I'm a member of this group. Don't, don't question my Akita now, okay? Because I'm not an atheist, all right? I come here to practice. And what I mean by practice is I, I like to use people <laughs> as punching bags for my arguments. And uh, I like to test my arguments out on atheists. So I go online sometimes and, you know, poke at them. So um, this forum is called Warang Atheist. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm not Malaysian, I'm sorry. Um, and it has 3,537 members. Most of them claim to be Murtadin. Okay? So you have over 3,000, if you count, give or a few, maybe the theists in there that are arguing, okay? Over 3,000 apostates on this forum alone. All right. So that 0% seems a little bit, uh, doesn't make much sense does it? And this is actually my Facebook page, so I, I'm seeing some of the brothers here probably on their phones trying to add me. So, okay, you can save it for later. Uh, sisters, please don't do that. Uh, not saying that you are, but uh, my, my future wife might kill me, so please don't do that. Okay, so if we can, yeah, future, I'm still keeping it that way. So, next, okay. Please? One more. All right, so let's go to uh, some more information that I found rather shocking, rather startling. If you click again, atheism by religious affiliation. Actually, these same uh, researchers, they did surveys on people who claim to be of certain religious groups. Interesting, right? On a global scale. So let's look at those religious groups, if we could. Among the major religious affiliations surveyed on a global scale, the following percentages have either declared themselves convinced atheists, that'll be the first number you see, non-religious, and or undecided, meaning they don't know if they're atheist or not yet. Okay? Can we go to the uh, next? Christian, Jewish, Hindu, and Muslim. Okay? So let's see about Christians. Declared atheist, convinced, 1% globally. Not bad. Jewish. 2%, not surprised. Hindu, 3%. Muslim, 3% of the global population of Muslims is considered to be convinced atheists. People who say that they're Muslim, but yet they're actually atheists. Okay, these are people who have yet to apostate maybe, or maybe they have apostated and they just, they still declare the title. So this is non-religiosity. Among the Christians is 16%. Jewish, 54%, once again, not surprised. Hindu, 12%, Muslim, 20. 20% non-religious globally. So now you have 23% basically on the edge of their faith or completely outside. Okay, this is only in 2012. The numbers have risen since then. We don't know the exact percentages, but I think Saudi Arabia now, as I, they say it was 5% last time, but I think it rose to 6 or 7 in the past few years. 
That's almost 10% of the population that has now convinced atheists out of a majority Muslim population in the most conservative parts of the Middle East and the Muslim world in general. And the undecideds, 4% for Christian, Jewish, 6% Hindu, 3 and Muslim, 3. So, in terms of the potential atheist, you have 23% in the Muslim world. So almost a third of the global Muslim population is either not religious or they're becoming atheist. Does that sound uh, a little shocking? How many Muslims are in the world? A little higher than that. It's about 1.8 something now. So what's 20% of that population? Can you imagine? You can do the math by yourself. I'm not going to do it in my head because I'll have a headache. But, um, but imagine that's a very significant number. Okay? Please continue. All right, let's see. Islamic scholars are only now starting to address this. I just read this report recently, the World Bulletin. Uh, click again, please. Egyptians, uh, Egypt's Muslim Christian authorities unite against atheism. And I'm going to read you this little story here. Christian churches in Egypt say they're joining forces with Egypt's Al-Azhar. Okay, so the Christians are the ones who approach the Muslims. All right. The church and Al-Azhar are drafting a constructive mechanism to address atheism. This statement came following a two-day conference organized jointly between Al-Azhar and the church aimed at forging a scholarly response to atheism, which they said has been spreading increasingly in Egypt over the past three years. Okay, so they're actually quite alarmed by this phenomenon. They think there's something very problematic about this, especially among the youth. All right, now you're probably wondering that if the scholars are finally deciding to construct a response to atheists, why am I standing here? Because I'm not a scholar, right? Well, uh, before we go to the next slide, I'd like to explain that. Um, the scholarly tradition, the ulama, while they are still advanced in Arabic and in terms of the traditional studies, okay, um, there has been a sharp decline in terms of how they address outside religions, to be honest with you. They are still utilizing arguments from several centuries ago. The problem is that atheists have changed their beliefs in the past hundred years and many people don't know that, unless, of course, you study at the philosophy department, <laughs> which uh, is unfortunate because it should be common knowledge. Um, so the arguments that a lot of the Muslims and the scholars are using are actually not effective for this new brand of atheism. And we're going to discuss what that type of atheism is, the contemporary form of atheism as it is today. Please continue. So what does this have to do with me? You're probably wondering to yourself. If you're alarmed at all by these percentages, if you're alarmed at all by the fact that Muslims have begun to stray away from their religion, if you're alarmed at all that atheism is actually the fastest growing ideology on the planet, it's not Islam, by the way. People think it's Islam, that's not true. Atheism is growing at a 20% faster rate. Okay? So what does that have to do with me? Well, first off, how about we address the Qur'an? Because whenever we want to ask a question about our lives, we should address the Qur'an and the Sunnah, correct? Okay, so what does the Qur'an say? Who could say, any, bismillah, who could say anything better than someone who summons to Allah and acts rightly and says, I am one of the Muslims. So this is a, this is a, basically, the Qur'an, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying that anyone who does da'wah, okay, they're the successful ones. This is somebody who, is at a very high rank. Okay, continue, please. The Quran also says, let there be a community among who, you who call to the good and enjoy the right and forbid the wrong. They are the ones who have success. They are the ones who have success. So right now, the Quran is telling you that to do da'wah in general, in general, is to receive reward. Okay, to, to, or to correct a wrong is to receive a reward. Okay. We have uh, the Hadith literature also backs this. And the Prophet ﷺ said to Ali, But Allah, if a single person is guided by Allah through you, it will be better for you than a whole lot of red camels. Now, red camels were also a very valued 
asset back then. Okay, so what it means is if you want to, to translate it into contemporary terminology, a lot of red Ferraris or a lot of you know, diamonds or tons of gold, Think anything that you would consider to be most valuable to you. So bringing one person to Islam is more valuable for you in the afterlife than, than any sort of material gain. And the Quran also provides sort of the, the example that should be uh, the, the example for you in, uh, to perform this deed. So you have an excellent model in the Messenger of Allah uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for all who put their hope in Allah on the last day and remember Allah much. Continue please. Say, and this is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say, this is my way. I call to Allah with inner sight or basira. Okay. I and all who follow me, glory be to Allah, I am not one of the idolaters, not one of the disbelievers. Okay, continue. In the Sunnah, the Prophet said, he who has asked something he knows and conceals it will have a bridle of fire put on, on him on the day of resurrection. So actually the information I'm giving you today, you should probably spread that around <laughs> because it would be very bad not to. Um, please continue. There's actually a weaker hadith, um, and we use weak hadith, of course, to support. We don't always use them for direct evidence, but when they're in, you know, they're, they supplement. So this one is actually even more interesting. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever conceals knowledge which Allah has made beneficial for mankind's affairs of religion. So it's very specific there, if you notice. Okay. Allah will bridle him with the reins of fire on the day of resurrection. Please continue. <coughs> The Qur'an continues, so do not obey the disbelievers, but use this Qur'an to battle against them with all your might. Jihad. With the sword of the Qur'an. The hadith states that I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, He who amongst you sees something abominable should modify it with the help of his hand. Many people know this hadith already. If he is not strong enough to do so, then with his tongue. And if he is still not strong enough to do so, then at least to abhor it in one's heart. And that's the weakest of iman. The weaker uh, variation of the sort of strive in jihad with your hands, your tongues, and your wealth. Okay, continue. And this is what I really want to discuss, actually. Commenting on the ayah that we just uh, revealed earlier, Ibn Qayyim, okay, said jihad with decisive proof and the tongue takes precedence over jihad with the sword and the spear. Takes precedence, meaning that it's first, beyond all things. Today we talk a lot about fighting the kuffar. But in fact, the Prophet wasallam, as an example to us, said that the precedence is with your, your tongue first, with arguments, argumentation. Everyone has a succession of angels in front of him and behind him, guarding by Allah's command. Allah never changes a person's state until they change what is in themselves. When Allah desires evil for a people, there is no averting it. They have no protector apart from him. Now before you go on, uh, I would like to explain why I brought this, uh, brought this ayah up. And a lot of people often um, misconstrue, and I'm saying this very deliberately, misconstrue this ayah to me is a personal endeavor. Change myself. If I change myself, then my condition will change. However, this is not the case. It can be read in that way. However, the traditional opinion is that it's a collective duty. It's not talking about you personally. Okay, it's not talking about how you change yourself and then your condition will change. It's talking about the community in general. And we have evidence for this from Imam Qurtubi. Andalusian scholar, okay? He is probably one of my ancestors, I don't know. So, uh, he's commenting on this ayah. Here Allah Most High informs us in this verse that he will not change a people until change occurs in them, whether from themselves or those in charge of them or those put over them for a reason. However, the verse does not mean that punishment will be sent by Allah for someone who commits a sin. Rather, punishment and affliction may be sent down due to the sins of others based on what the Prophet Sallallahu replied to when asked by his companions, are we going to be destroyed even when we have righteous people among us? Where he said, yes, when filth and corruption becomes prevalent, 
and Allah knows best. This is a community injunction. When it means that you must change the condition of yourself before, the, before Allah does so, he's talking about not just yourself, he's talking about also your community. Tasawwuf, for instance, is not just a personal matter. Tasawwuf is only tasawwuf if you extend it out to your neighbors. Imam Malik, for instance, stated that there is no sharia without tasawwuf and there's no tasawwuf without what? Sharia. The two are interconnected. It's impossible to separate them. So jihad, okay, is a collective duty. It's an obligation upon all of us, whether by the tongue, whether by the sword, or whether by our wealth. And it is in, uh, incumbent upon us, especially when it's within our own community. So this has a lot to do with us in the sense that we have a rise of anti-intellectualism, we have a rise of atheism, we have a rise of people who are becoming apostates in our faith. So it is an obligation upon all of us to do intellectual jihad. Not just for the sake of our own souls, but for the sake of our community around us. This is not an option. This is absolutely not an option at all. If we consider that if somebody invades our territory, our land, our homes, kicks down our door, and tries to kill our family, we consider an obligation to fight back, correct? In the same way, our faith, our prophet, so it honor, is more important to us than our lives. So our obligation to defend our religion is much higher than our own lives. Okay, that's why it is said that jihad with the tongue, meaning the intellect, takes precedence, precedence over that of the sword. Okay? So what's there to learn? Oh, there's going to be a lot, actually. Okay. Well, what is atheism and the types of atheism? That's going to be one. Continue, please. This sort of is a small uh, you know, table of contents. The five most common atheist beliefs. I'm going to give you all the five most common ones. Continue. Arguments used by atheists. Why is atheism becoming more popular? Responding to atheist beliefs and arguments. Common objections to Islam by atheists and disbelievers in general. Atheist psychology and how to debate. And introduction to logical fallacies. And uh, don't, con don't go to the next page yet. Basically, we're going to cover um, all the way to this point right here. Responding to atheist beliefs and arguments in this day. Okay, the next day we will go on to common objections, atheist psychology, introduction to logical fallacies. Tomorrow I'm basically going to teach you how to argue. And you're probably asking me, well, uh, how can I do that? What, what credentials? Well, part of my education in philosophy was that they teach you how to argue. <laughs> so um, I actually had probably, I don't know, five or six classes on just logical fallacies alone. Um, and a logical fallacy is essentially just an argument that is invalid or a statement that's invalid. So it's things that you commonly, that you actually should not say in an argument. I'm going to teach you how to avoid those things and how to point them out. So that when you actually get into discussion with somebody and you know, you can see whether what they're saying is valid and whether it's worth addressing. And you can point out and say, look, you know, I think you're saying something wrong here. So then you don't have to get diverted from, what you're, from your message, okay? Because actually a lot of people, we will crumble that up and throw it away. So a lot of people um, usually get diverted by rhetoric. You know, a lot of people, they know how to talk in this day and age, but if you actually examine the way that people talk, you'll notice that there's no substance to most of it. So what is atheism? And this is probably gonna be the most important thing that we need to learn right now because definitions matter. Before we talk about a subject, we need to know what it is, obviously. So, Atheism in the dictionary today, the Oxford Dictionary, says, uh, states that the disbelief or lack of belief in God or gods. Now, before we go on, I'd like to ask, does anybody here understand this definition? Does anybody know the distinctions or what this definition is trying to say? Because prior to about 10 years, you know, the recent decade, this definition used to be only one of these two. It, there was no or. It was only one. It was the disbelief in God, meaning the belief that God does not exist. 
So now it's recently changed by including lack of belief in God or gods. And that's actually a very important distinction which we're going to get into because um, that actually defines the majority of atheists in the world today. Most atheists will not say they believe God does not exist. Most, I'm talking about 99%, will say that they simply lack a belief in God. Isn't that agnostic? Uh, we will get to the uh, question and answers. We'll get to, this, uh, to that uh, as well. Um, but you are correct to some degree, except that atheists have actually combined the concept of agnosticism with atheism now. And I'll show you how they did that. So the origins of the late 16th century from the French atheisme, from the Greek atheos, uh, from the negative a, which means without, and theos, which is God. Okay, continue, please. Historical fun fact. One more. The word atheism was commonly used by certain religious communities against other religious communities. The first time that it was actually used in this way was with the Christians. When the Christians first came about in the Roman Empire, the Romans called them atheists because they did not believe in the pagan gods. They said, you don't believe in our gods, you're atheist. And the Christians responded and said, no, you're an atheist because you don't believe in the true God. So they were calling each other atheists. During the Crusades, the Muslims and the Christians were calling each other atheists. Believe it or not, that's very strange, right? Because they did not believe in each other. They both said, we both basically, we said, you don't believe in Allah, who is the true God, so you're atheists, you don't believe in God. And the Christians responded, said, you don't believe in Jesus as a God, so therefore you're an atheist. So it was actually, it was a, a much more specific meaning Okay, and nowadays it's more broadly means just in general somebody who doesn't believe in any gods. And so the concept of God itself has become equalized in the term atheist. Okay, so what types of atheism are there? Okay, one more. There's practical atheism, which is about behavior. Can you stop please? And practical atheism is simply about how you act as a person. Okay, your, your attitude towards the existence of God. So we have something under practical atheism called apatheism. Does anybody know the word apathetic? Apathetic? I Pathetic. Yeah, that's, that's, a good, that's a good one, yeah. So, <laughs> apathetic. Apathetic means you don't, you, you have no concern for it. You don't care. So when I'm apathetic, like say about politics, I'm apathetic about politics. I just don't care about politics. I do care about politics, I'm just using an example. But, um, so apathyism is doesn't care if God exists at all. So it's not like you ask him, does God exist? He's just like, I, it doesn't really matter to me. You know, I'm gonna live my life like this anyway. So, you know. Um, then there's non-religious. One more. Doesn't care about what God desires. Now there's actually a distinction between these. One just doesn't care if God exists. The other one acknowledges God exists, but doesn't care that he has commands or that he has a will. He just doesn't, you know. He could be a deist. A deist is somebody who believes in God, but a God that doesn't interfere with the world. But generally, a non-religious person is somebody who, who acknowledges there's a God, but acts like an atheist. So it's somebody who may be, for instance, a Muslim, but drinks, fornicates, does everything an atheist would do, and acts like it's not a big deal. So, you know, sisters in Islam. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I had to throw that in there. Um, so then we have theoretical atheism, which is about ideas. And this is the one that we're really going to be discussing the most here. Uh, one more, please. So there are two types of atheism in the theoretical level. There's strong or positive atheism, which is the belief that God does not exist. The belief that God does not exist. So they have a firm belief that God does not exist. Okay? Then there's weak or negative atheism. That's the one that lacks a belief in God. They say, I don't know. Okay? They say, I don't have enough evidence. I don't have enough reason to believe that there's a God. I simply lack the belief. That's it. So don't blame me for anything. That's, you know, so it's, a, sort of, it's almost like a defense mechanism. And they, they actually use it that way as well. We'll get into that more later. 
So these are the, this is actually a very general um, categorization because there's actually quite a few more atheists. But the popular ones that you're going to be approached by or that you're going to approach in your life are going to be from this area right here, the weak atheist section. And they typically have very common beliefs. Whereas the strong atheists, I've dealt with them in philosophy circles, usually professors of philosophy and things like this. They usually have very strange <coughs> ideas that you're typically not going to encounter. And I'll give you one example. I had one professor in college in my bachelor's, when I was in my bachelor's, and uh, we would have interesting discussions. And, it, and I wasn't concerned so much that he was an atheist, more I was more concerned about the fact that he believed something else, which I, I was constantly trying to convince him otherwise, because I, I just felt it was very absurd. So his belief was that he didn't know if the, real, if the world was real. And um, well, when, when you talk to somebody like that, you really can't get any farther. Uh, because if they don't believe the world is real, then... Would you speak Huh? Uh, no, actually, he was a uh, he was a uh, Anglo American former Christian, um, but he believed the world wasn't real. And I don't mean that he had like a Platonist idea, like he thought there was illusions or anything. No, he believed he honestly did not know whether he was living in the real world. Um, so he kind of liked the movie The Matrix a lot. So he was always trying to debate whether what was actually going on was actually going on. So he was preoccupied with himself quite a bit. And so his atheism was at least of my concerns. Um, and of course, by doing that, he also negated his own existence. He didn't know if he actually existed. And you may think that's absurd, but there's actually philosophers that are like that. And in the philosophy department, we have a, a strange phenomenon, and this may discourage you from studying philosophy. We have a strange phenomenon where we call uh, Nietzsche burnout. Nietzsche burnout. You know Nietzsche? He's a German existentialist philosopher. Um, he was responsible for the nihilist movement, which means that there was no values in life. Basically, our values were determined subjectively by human beings. So basically, our values, what we consider to be moral or good or bad, is determined solely by humans, okay? Based on what we just simply desire, what we consider to be the normal good, or whatever. It, it's, it's all subjective in that sense. Well, when somebody becomes a nihilist and they start to lose their ground in reality, meaning they've jumped into philosophy so much that they sort of drown themselves in these skepticism. Uh, they end up committing suicide. And uh, I've known a few colleagues and a few students in my philosophy department who have unfortunately succumbed to that because they question themselves too much to the point where they kill themselves. So um, uh, something else I'd like to mention was that uh, theoretical atheism has a direct causation onto practical atheism. Okay, so any beliefs that you hear from the theoretical side will automatically influence the behavior of the society that they're in. And we'll get to that more in a minute as well. So what are the common beliefs of atheists? Well, before we get into that, let's have some story time. Okay. So I brought up a book that, uh, you guys are familiar with story time? You've had story time before? I remember story time. I love story time. I miss it a lot, you know, I'm 30 now. And it's like, you know, I wish I could go back to that time. So I've decided to, uh, to bring you all back to this time. So I brought a book here. And um, I thought I'd tell you a story. It's a fairy tale about atheism. Okay. And this is what atheists tell themselves. But it's more of like a childish fashion. So maybe you'll get a kick out of it, I don't know. So I'm gonna sit here, <laughs> like the good teacher that I am, and you can all just listen, okay? All right, it's <clears throat> good? All right, once upon a time, <laughs> I'm serious, this is it. That's it, drop the paper there. Once upon a time, there was a terrible monster that lived in the sky. Do anybody know what this is referring to yet? Okay, we'll keep going. No one had ever seen it because it lived a long way away and because it was invisible. But everyone knew it was there because a long time ago it had shown itself to some very clever men. These very clever men explained how the monster had one head, three bodies, and a thousand eyes which, with which it could see into people's souls. 
They told terrible tales of what the monster would do if it got angry, but also of how kind it was if people would only worship it without thought or question. They explained how the monster had given them a powerful magic, which if used rightly would protect the world from evil. Sometimes the monster would get angry, and when it did, the clever men would offer it sacrifices, dragging people into market squares where they would burn them alive, just to show the monster how much they loved it. The people listened to the very clever men and believed them, but they still yearned to be free of the monster. And then one day, a few brave men, who had only ever pretended to believe in the monster, unearthed a chest of strange metal. The chest had been hidden by an earlier, wiser, freer people who had lived in the land before the monster came and had known a better way of life. Ever so slowly, the men began to work the metal, which they called reason, using it to forge a new weapon, which they called science. And they used science to attack the monster. And the very clever men, they had to be very careful though at first because if anyone was caught using science, they would be dragged into market squares where they would be burned alive. And indeed, this was how many men lost their lives. But these were brave men, not to be fooled by fables or threats. Their band multiplied and their weapons grew in number and power until one day a brilliant reclusive rebel invented a super weapon, which he called evolution, which could punch clean through the monster's armored scales. After that, the attacks increased in frequency and ferocity until one day the rebels were able to show the people what they had long known themselves. The monster had never actually existed. It was just a tale told by the very clever men to keep themselves in riches and power. Slowly the truth spread and although some very clever men still cling to riches and power and some very stupid ones still believe them, gradually, wonderfully, the world is being set free. The end. Was that a good story? Lovely story. Right? Okay. Well, as juvenile as it may seem, this is actually what many atheists believe. So I'm gonna put my story chair back. Okay, so we're gonna get into the actual academic discussion of those atheist beliefs. Okay, and uh, I gave you that story because, not just to entertain you, but I actually wanted you to, to understand what they believe. And, and once you see what these beliefs are in their academic fashion, you'll start to translate it into that myth. So the first common belief of the contemporary atheist is something called anti-theism. Okay, it's called anti-theism. Theism is the belief in God. Anti is what? Against. Okay? The belief that theism and religion in general need to be opposed and eradicated because they are intellectually unjustifiable and harmful to mankind. Next, please. One such individual by the name of Sam Harris from the United States, the author of The End of Faith. He's the first new atheist author. He said this. If I could wave a magic wand and get rid of either rape or religion, I would not hesitate to get rid of religion. I think more people are dying as a result of our religious myths than as a result of any other ideology. So this man says that he would rather get rid of religion than rape. That's, I don't know if that's shocking to you. I, I think that's quite disgusting. And I'm sorry to be so direct. Um, Another uh, famous author by the name of Christopher Hitchens, late Christopher Hitchens, he recently passed away a few years ago. I'm not an, even an atheist so much as I'm an anti-theist. I not only maintain that all religions are versions of the same untruth, but I hold that the influence of churches and the effect of religious belief is positively harmful. Okay, so this is their first major belief. Next one. The next one is evidentialism. This is a philosophical term. Evidentialism. I'll explain it to you more. The belief that any or all positions require evidence to be accepted. In other words, a person is justified in believing, not believing, or withholding belief based on whether or not they have sufficient evidence at the given time a proposition is made. Once this is used in opposition to the concept, often this is used in opposition to the concept of faith or belief without evidence. Okay? So the new atheist, such as this man, Richard Dawkins, giving a speech in 1992. He said, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think 
and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. So they based, the atheists claim that they based all of their beliefs on evidence and they, believe, and they based their rejection of beliefs based on evidence, or lack thereof, excuse me. Number three, scientism. We will get into this term more actually in the near future. This is actually a word. Many atheists will deny this term. However, it's been around since the 1800s, maybe even earlier than that. Um, the belief that the methods of natural science or the categories and things recognized in natural science form the only proper elements in any philosophical or other inquiry. In other words, science is the only way to know anything. The new atheist or the majority of atheists in the world today actually believe this. And Victor Stenger, who has just recently died as well, uh, he uh, wrote in The New Atheism, defending Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, and all the other atheist uh, leaders who have written a lot of literature on the subject. Uh, could you go back? Sorry. He said, and they recommended this book, so they firmly believe him in this respect. The New Atheist firmly insists that the personal Abrahamic or Islamic uh, perception of God is a scientific hypothesis that can be tested by the standard methods of science. So they honestly believe that the concept of God can be tested us using scientific inquiry. Okay, next. Number four, humanism. Oh, what happened? Okay, humanism. The belief that human beings should be the center of mankind's concerns, that we are the only source of ethics, legislation, and values in this world, and that God or gods are unnecessary in determining our destiny. The ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus uh, would set the stage for this line of thinking. Oh, actually, that's an error. I want to point out, I make errors sometimes. It's not Epicurus, his name is Euthyphro. Okay, so I will edit that later for your convenience, I apologize. He said, if God is all powerful, then why can he not stop evil? And if he is all good, then why does he refuse? That's a question that we will be getting into actually later as well. It's called the, the, the argument for evil or a theodicy issue that Brother Rehan had mentioned earlier. And A.C. Grayling, uh, who wrote The God Argument in 2014, said the human good is for human responsibility to discern and enact without reliance upon or invocation of any of, any of the major religions which claim a transcendental authority and posthumous rewards or punishments. So he is basically claiming that human beings are the only uh, rulers of their fate and destiny, okay, and that we do not need a God to determine that. Next. Number five, progressionism. This is another philosophical term. This is one that many atheists actually don't even know they have. Um, but I've encountered many of these, uh, many arguments from this position. Um, and the belief that humanity is gradually advancing in science, technology, ethics, and legislation due to the absence of religion. This belief became popularized around the time of the Enlightenment, okay? Uh, and Christopher Hitchens, once again, stated, one must state it plainly, religion comes from the period of human prehistory where nobody had the smallest idea what was going on. Okay, so basically he's saying that religion came purely from ignorance in the past when people didn't have science. It comes from the balding, oh, wow, you're coming faster than me. So, it comes from the balding and fearful infancy of our species and it is a babyish attempt to meet our inescapable demand for knowledge. All attempts to reconcile faith with science and reason are consigned to failure and ridicule for precisely these reasons. Okay, next. So, now that we understand the primary atheist beliefs, let's get into their main arguments. How much time do we have? Still? Good? Almost? Okay, 30 minutes left. So, the first argument, uh, by the way, I've cataloged these myself. Um, this is not from a book, 
this is from my own personal experience and study over the years. I've debated with many atheists. Um, I have discussed with many atheist philosophers, etc. So these are my own um, categorizations. Okay, this is what I have found to be the majority of arguments throughout the years. The argument for anti-theism. So you see P1 here, it means premise one. Okay, so when you see, in philosophy, we like to write our arguments like this. So we put the first premise, like P1, P2, and the conclusion is C at the end. So just in case you need to know. P1, any belief that teaches false views about the natural world and ethics should be opposed. Anybody agree with that? Yeah. Okay, next. Theistic religions teach false views about the natural world and ethics. Okay, number three, or conclusion, sorry. Therefore, theistic religions should be opposed. That's the argument. Now, this is a syllogism, and a syllogism is just a very concise format for which the argument goes. Now, in actuality, there is much more to this than meets the eye. Okay, for instance, in premise two. All right, everyone agrees with premise one, but not everyone agrees with premise two. Now, the new atheists will make arguments for premise two. Okay, so there's more information that goes under there. All right, so they'll say, well, we have historical evidence that shows that religions cause more wars, or we have a lot of evidence to show that uh, there's more extremists in religious societies than non-religious societies. So they'll do this to back that up. Okay, but you can oppose this and say, no, that's wrong. Okay, but the actual argument itself is valid. And I'm gonna teach you this also for those of you who don't know uh, any basic logic or have taken a basic logic course, but there's a difference between a valid argument and a sound argument, okay? A valid argument means that it's logically consistent. That means that it, 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 it's coherent, okay? It, it's true by definition, all right? However, a sound argument is true in reality. So an argument can be valid, but it doesn't mean it's sound. It can be false. Okay, and if an argument is invalid, then it's automatically false. All right. So, this argument implies that such beliefs are harmful to mankind. An empirical experience claim based on observation, okay, and based on the belief of anti-theism. Next, please. Primary atheist arguments number two. The argument for the irrationality of theism and religion, theism being the belief in God. P1. Any claim that lacks evidence is unjustified. Anybody agree with this? I'm going to try to change your mind by the end of this course. Okay. P2. Unjustified claims are irrational. Now, does everybody agree with that one? It depends. Subjective. It's subjective? Okay, we'll get into that. Theism and religion lack evidence. Okay. Therefore, theism and religion are irrational. implies that evidence is necessary for every claim. The implication is there. Based on the belief of evidentialism. Are you starting to see connections? Okay. Next. The argument for the universality of science. P1, evidence is necessary for any belief to be justified and explained. So this is based on evidentialism, the first premise. Premise two, science offers the only reliable form of evidence and explanation. Theism and religion are beliefs. Therefore, only scientific evidence can justify theism and religion. Implies that evidence is necessary to justify any belief, basically from the last argument. Implies science is universal in determining justification and explanation for any belief, and based on the belief of what? Scientism, right? Next. The argument for evil and human independence, believe it or not, the argument for evil that we discussed earlier ties in to what we're going to see as humanism in a minute. So we're going to see it through this argument. It is claimed that God is all-powerful and all-good. Is this correct? In Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, right? If God were all-powerful, he could prevent evil from happening. If God were all-good, he would not allow evil to exist. A moral person cannot rely on or follow a God that cannot prevent evil or does not want to. Evil exists. Therefore, God is either not all-powerful or all-good, and thus mankind should be, what? Apotheistic. Remember apotheism? Means they should not care. 
that he exists or not. It implies that the existence of evil cancels out God's attributes and his authority. It implies that evil exists and there is no good purpose for it at all. Based on the belief of humanism, and concludes that people should simply not care about God's existence. Okay, next. Number five. The argument for incompatibility between science and religion. Or you can just call this the argument, from, the argument for incompatibility. For something to be compatible, it must be complementary. Okay, so that's very basic. Basically, what I'm trying to say there is that they should not contradict each other. They should not... Okay, to reject one thing over another means that something is not complementary. Society had to reject religious dogma for science to advance. Therefore, religion is incompatible with science. Now, before we go into this section, P3 is the contested issue. P3 is the contested issue. Okay, the first two premises most people will agree to. The third one is the issue. Did people really have to reject scientific dogma? I mean, excuse me, uh, <laughs> that's also true. But <laughs> did, they, did they really have to reject religious dogma to, to let science advance? That's actually a common myth. And we read in that little nice little fairy tale, that's what most atheists believe, is that the reason that we have scientific advancement today, the reason we have all the health care, that we have all the weapons and technology that we have is because people unburdened themselves from the shackles of religious dogma, okay? Because we are secularist. Isn't that what happened uh, with the church in the earlier time? You know? That's what's claimed and during the Enlightenment, yes, in the Renaissance and things like this. Well, actually, it started during the Renaissance, fully enveloped itself in the Enlightenment period, and then when the state took over... Maybe they're claiming that, because that was a false... Argument. They are claiming that. Um, and they do use the, the history of the church as evidence of this. However, even that is contestable. Because in actuality, and I'm going to just explain this more, but since you brought it up, in actuality, the Catholic Church was uh, a very big facilitator of science, one of the largest. Um, in fact, it gave more funding to scientific, ev to scientific inquiry and uh, technological production than most other institutions did at the time. Now, the reason that we have some problems, and since we're already getting into the topic, I'll just sort of sidetrack here. Uh, anybody heard of Galileo? Okay, you know what happened to him? Huh? He was killed. I don't remember exactly remember. I know he was killed, though. Uh, but they say it's because he wanted to replace a scientific theory that the church upheld. Now, the church upheld at the time the Pultimic system, which means that this, the Earth was the center of the galaxy, the center of the universe, okay? And that the sun rotated around the Earth and the moon. Okay, so, anyways, um, Galileo apparently came by and said, no, you're wrong. It's Copernicus theory, uh, Coper uh, excuse me, Copernicus theory that was correct, and that uh, everything rotates around the sun. So because of this, the church got scared and said, no, you're wrong, we're gonna kill you because you made blasphemy. That's the simple story. The actual story is much more complex than that. In fact, many of the early church leaders were already moving in that direction. The problem was is that when Galileo was trying to convince the Pope, you know, the Pope at the time, that his theory was correct, he was extremely insulting in his letters. He used to call the Pope stupid and ignorant for not accepting his ideas. So the Pope got a little personal and decided to send his guards down there and take him away. So that was actually the main reason. It had nothing to do with the fact that Galileo just randomly said one day, oh, uh, your theory is wrong, and then they killed him. Um, that, that's actually very absurd and very juvenile belief. But in fact, uh, a lot of atheists actually hold that position. They think that uh, scientists were just randomly persecuted because they had different ideas, which is actually, usually it's more political than that. So, oh, sorry, go back one more time. <laughs> so, okay, so implies society rejected religious dogma in favor of scientific advancement. Implies religion was an obstacle to scientific advancement. We'll discuss that more as well. Based on supposed historical conflicts between science and religion, something I already discussed just now in brief, based on the beliefs of what? Progressionism and scientism. Okay, so one more. The argument for secularism. Now, this is a very important argument, and uh, it's probably um, one of the most important ones that you're going to need to learn as well. 
And this one is directly affects you, okay? And this is something that our atheists argue actually predominantly in society. Anything that predominantly causes violence and sectarianism should never be a governing force. Is this correct? Anybody agree with this? Anything that causes sectarianism and violence should never be a governing force. Meaning it shouldn't be in your politics. Right? It should not be policing you. It should not be governing you. Okay? P2, religion predominantly causes violence and sectarianism. Therefore, religion should never be a governing force. That's the basic argument. Okay? And this is the main thing that atheists will talk about on and on and on and on and on and on and on in their discussions. Uh, even before the existence of God comes into the picture, this is their main issue, <laughs> is that religion is a drive for violence and division in society. Okay? Now, uh, historical and observational claim of the supposed predominance of violence, sectarianism, and religion implies secularism is predominantly peaceful and unifying and based on the beliefs of humanism and progressionism. Before you go on, I will be discussing this at length, this discussion, that's, uh, this, this particular argument, because this is very important for us. So I'm gonna give you a brief of what I actually believe in this, on this position here. The historical and observational claim of the supposed predominance of violence and sectarianism in religion is false. Obviously, I'm gonna say that, you probably already knew, right? But it's very false. Um, the greatest atheist argument, I put a question mark there because I wanna save that for later, actually in part two. And um, this argument is important for many reasons. One, most atheists don't know that they're making it. I know that sounds strange. They, they, they subconsciously, they make the argument like this. They have certain beliefs that they form, that they've had from the previous beliefs that I mentioned, and they make a statement, which I will mention in this argument later on. And um, it's very effective because they shut down all conversation this way. This is how they win the argument against people who uh, have religious belief. And um, the other reason it's very important is because it is the central argument that I'm going to be using in my own arguments to refute them. So I'm actually gonna be utilizing this very argument that they use, which I'll display to you in part two, okay, to refute them. So I'm gonna use their own argument against them. And I've been working on this argument for three years. Yeah, I know it sounds like ridiculous, like why would it take so long, right? So, <laughs> because believe it or not, when you have, when you're around a lot of other philosophers, you're constantly being critiqued. So you have to keep like redoing it. Oh, okay, okay, this could be problematic, so I'll change this word. Okay, no, I understand where you're coming from there. I don't wanna mess up, so maybe I'll. So you know, you have to keep reformatting until you get it just right, where it becomes uh, annoying to people. And uh, a philosopher knows that they have a good argument when it annoys people. You know, so that's, I know it's, it's, it's quite funny, but um, so right as of, as of the third year, I haven't had one objection to it. So I'm quite happy. Um, I've showed it to other professors. They say it's valid sound. So I'm waiting for somebody actually to give me something substantial. So that's why I like teaching it to people now, because I'm waiting for somebody to tell me no, that's wrong, because I want to see if I can make it better, you know? But um, so far, nothing. It's like a perfect Sudoku puzzle. <laughs> um, so I hope that uh, when I share it with you, it's not patent, by the way, so you can use it. You don't have to pay me anything. But uh, when you use it, inshallah, it'll be as effective for you as it was for me. Um, I have counted the number of times I've used it, and in every conversation that I've used it, it's been probably almost 200 now, I have stopped the debate. Um, and I've had a few people not convert to Islam, but they became theist as a result. So, alhamdulillah. Um, it's hard, it's much easier to actually to get people to become theists than Muslims. So, um, you know, I know. <laughs> so, okay, uh, I believe this is the end of uh, part one. Okay. 
So thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have a quick break for about 30 minutes, maybe if we can extend a little longer, because I think people want to eat breakfast. And uh, well, I'll determine that with you later. And we'll get into section two. Section two, before we go to the break, is going to be about basically the history of contemporary atheism. I'm going to go through some of the leading figures, what they believe, and the progression of the beliefs from a certain point in time. I'm going to discuss why there's actually a rise in atheism. I'm going to give you the exact reasons. And I'm also going to discuss uh, more about scientism, and I'm going to discuss this argument as well at the end. So uh, please enjoy your break, and um, thank you for listening to me blabber on. <laughs> thank you.